Nick. Hey, um, who's pumped to be on summer camp? Yeah. Who, uh, who enjoyed the bus ride down? Yeah. Who's on Team Alpha? Yeah. Who's on Team Omega? Yeah. I think I'm going to be on Team Omega. Yeah. Let's go. Um, all right. Hey, if I, if I haven't met you before, my name is Mitch, and um, it's, a, it's a real privilege to be able to open God's Word with you this week. Um, I'm the, the youth pastor at St. Faith's, and so um, yeah, I get to do this each week with lots of the people in this room, and uh, it's, it's one of the biggest joys in my life, it really is. I've been a part of St. Faith's um, since I was born, so 26 and a half years I've been coming to St. Faith's and I've the the joy and the privilege of going through high school, being part of Solis, um, and so to be able to come back and to be able to um, share God's word with you is um, it's just a real, real special thing for me. So um, particularly this book of Ephesians this week, not because of anything I say, but because of the words that are written here, um, I really do think that God is going to speak to us and help us to understand more about him, uh, like he did for me when I was... Uh, sitting on a camp much like this many years ago in high school. So I'm going um, to just pray again really quickly for our time in God's Word, uh, and then we're going to look at it together. So if you'd um, bow your heads and pray with me, that'd be awesome. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you that we have a reason to come together on camp this week. And um, I just want to pray and commit our time to you tonight. Uh, Father, you know we've had... Um, a hot car ride or bus ride down here that there's heaps of distractions and things going on for us right now um, and I just pray that you would take those things from our mind and replace them um, with what you have to say to us through Ephesians chapter 1 um, so please be gracious to us in that way and help us to be struck by what you've done for us in Jesus Amen, Amen. I want you to imagine that uh, in a couple of weeks' time, or a week and a half's time, that you start your first day at a new school. It's your first day at a brand new school, and you walk into your first classroom, and the teacher of that class says, Welcome to class. To start with, I would love to invite you to stand up, because you're the new kid, and I'm going to put you on the spot, and I want you to tell everyone else in the class a little bit about yourself. I want you to tell everyone a little bit about yourself. Now, in that moment, when you're put on the spot like that, what do you say? No. Yes. What do you say about yourself? You don't get the option of no, like someone down here said. You start explaining um, a little bit about yourself. What is it that you say? Is it, hey, look, I'm the new kid at school, but I'm going to be the best Fortnite player in the whole school, and everyone's going to recognize that by tomorrow? Is it, I'm a handballer, is it, I'm a skater, a soccer player, I'm into fashion, I'm an extrovert, I'm the class clown. What is it that defines you? What would you say? Because all of these things that I just mentioned, or all the things that might come to your mind, what they are, are identity statements. They're, they're statements about how we see ourselves, or about how we want other people to actually see us. They're statements about our identity. And the question that I want us to ask tonight is where do you find your identity? Where do you find your identity? Because I know for me, when I had just started out in high school, I found my identity uh, in being a good soccer player. My, my dream in life was actually to succeed and to become a professional soccer player. And um, that was what my whole identity was wrapped up in. I would, uh, I would get down in the backyard every day after school and I would be juggling the ball for hours and hours, doing whatever it would take for me to actually be able to succeed as a soccer player. And um, a couple of years after that, I had a coach tell me, Mitch, you're just too short to ever make it in soccer. Yeah, dagger, straight through the heart. And, um, and that, that wrecked me for a while, because there was no chance really after that, and I stopped getting picked in certain teams, that I would actually make it as a soccer player. And so I thought, oh, you know, here's what I'll do. I'll, um, I'll use my guitar uh, playing ability and my 
singing ability and I had a form of band and we made a band and I was the singer and I played guitar as well. Believe it or not, I could actually sing at this point. And then like six months later, after we'd like won a band comp and things like that, my voice broke and now I'm just like completely tone deaf and monotone. So that kind of went out the window as well and my identity of being um, the next big thing and the next boy band that succeeded. Well, that kind of evaporated too. So well, I know what I'll do. I'll try and be really, really funny. I'm just going to be the class clown that everyone laughs at. Now hands up if you go to Cubby. A bunch of people. Does anyone remember Mrs. Riley? Yeah. <laughs> oh, hey, Mrs. Riley. Um, she was my geography teacher for a long, long time. And um, one day I thought, you know what would be really funny is if before she comes into the class, I sneak in before and I um, put myself in one of the cupboards lying down and just pretend to be there all lesson. And so whenever she has her back turned to the board, I'll look out the gap in the cupboard and just yell things out. And um, she'd turn around, had no idea what was going on. I thought, this is awesome. Everyone knows me as like the funny kid in the class. And um, now that worked for a little while. But then Mrs. Riley and the other teachers started catching on to that. And everyone in my class started kind of getting sick of me just being a bit of an idiot. And so I was like, oh, this, this isn't really working either. I've kind of gone through soccer, gone through trying to be in a band, gone through trying to be funny. I know what I'll do. About to start year 11, I've got two years left of school. I'm just gonna knuckle down, work hard, and get a really good job after school that pays me heaps of money. Sounds good, right? It's like, okay, I'm gonna do a business degree, I'll do finance, I'll make money. And so I worked really, really hard during year 11 and year 12 and got an ATAR that I was proud of. And um, when I got my marks back, I was like, sweet, I've made it. This is somewhere that's finally good to put my identity in. And a week after that, I was at work and uh, I got a phone call saying that I need to come down to Monavale Hospital straight away. And as I got down to Monavale, and I walked in, and I saw my family and a doctor there, we were told that my, my little sister Rach had just passed away. And like that, all of the success that I thought I had just meant nothing. And in the next year after that, after I finished school, what I realized was everywhere for my whole life that I had been putting my identity in would disappear in a moment. That all these places, that actually just don't really work. They don't really satisfy, they don't really fulfill. Because they, they all ultimately run out. that wherever any of us in this room have placed our identity, it's, it's actually not going to work. It's not worth it. It's going to let you down. It's going to let you down. Where do you find your identity? Where do you find your identity? Is it in sport? Is it in doing well at school? Is it in being popular or being funny? Maybe it's even in the really hard things that are going on in life. Anxiety, depression, your parents splitting up, being bullied at school, those things are all consuming and that sucks. What is defining your life? The, the reality is that you and I know that nothing that we've just spoken about is ever going to be what we need. Yeah, it just makes sense, doesn't it? And what I realized after Rach passed away was that we need something sure and firm and secure. So it's something that's actually not going to change to put our identity in. You see, without that, we're actually constantly going to be looking in the wrong places. We are constantly going to be looking in the wrong places. And what this passage that Nick read out for us before actually shows us is three claims that I reckon are unique to Christianity. 
for three claims that no other religion, no other person, and nothing else in this life offers about your identity. That no one else throughout all of history has ever claimed to be able to offer you. I want to say that they're firm and sure and secure. And they're actually the most beautiful truths that you could ever hear about your life if you hold them to be true. And so I want to invite you to consider if this describes who you are. If this passage tonight actually describes who you are right now. Whether you're a Christian or not in this room, we're going to go on a bit of a journey over the next 15 or 20 minutes and actually work out whether this describes us or not. So I want to get everyone to grab their Bibles back out if you've closed them. Or keep looking at them if you still have them in front of you. And we're just going to read the first three verses to start with of Ephesians chapter 1. Here we go. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Did you catch where he's saying that identity is actually found? He's saying it's in Christ Jesus. He says it a bunch of times just in those first few verses. And actually in the 14 verses that we're looking at tonight, he says it 11 different times. That their identity is located in Christ Jesus and nowhere else. That it's found only in Him. And Paul, the guy that's writing this, says, these spiritual blessings that I'm about to tell you about, following on from verse 3, they're like the pinnacle of what we have as Christians. It's like reaching the top of the mountain. And he says, they're only found in Jesus. And the first one that he's going to tell us about in verses 4 to 6 is this. He says that we're chosen in Him. He says we're chosen in Him. Have a look at me. Chosen in Jesus. That we're given a place in God's family through His Son. But did you catch when it happened? Did you actually hear about when God decided to do this? He said we're chosen from creation. Like literally before the world even began, before anything was formed, before there was anything in existence, he says, I chose you in my son Jesus. I'd actually plan for my son Jesus to come to earth that hasn't even been formed yet and die for you so that you could be part of my family. Before anything was in existence. It wasn't some afterthought that he was like, I feel sorry for these little human beings. Over to plan B, I'm going to jump in and save them, even though I didn't really want to. It's not like that. This was plan A. It was God's choice. And he decided to do that from the very beginning. For, for you to actually be part of his family. And he says it's for a purpose as well. He says, so you would be holy and blameless, which means so that you would actually be different from other people in this world. That your identity might be placed on something firm and secure, something that isn't going to change, rather than on all these things that are actually just going to ultimately let you down. And how did he do it? He decided to call us his son or his daughter. See, here it says son, and the reason for that is, at this time, it was actually only the firstborn son in the family that got the inheritance. They were the one that got all the blessing from their parents. And he's using this to try and show us that no matter where you are in your family order, no matter who you are, what's happened in your life, in Jesus, you can actually be part of the God of the universe's family. Crazy as that. <coughs> Christian in the room, this is what the God of the universe says about you. I chose you before the creation of the world to be my child. 
if you're not a Christian here tonight, this is the offer that the God of the universe is actually extending to you. An invitation to be part of his family, that he's cared about you from before the beginning of the world. It's good news. But it's also something I reckon that people find hard to understand sometimes. You know, do we choose to believe in God, or did he choose us? That whole predestination kind of debate. Many people say, well, we're not robots. <clears throat> like, we make choices in life. But then somehow what we read here, it's actually telling us, yeah, but even though that's true, at the same time, God has pieced things together in a certain way before the creation of the world as well. Here's how I imagine it working. I want to I show you something that's been helpful for me. Can I talk in front of these speakers, Jimmy? Cool. I imagine it like this, a big doorway. And this is Jesus' invitation up the top. And he throws it out to everyone. He says, come, follow me. That's an invitation that Jesus humbly gives to everyone. The Son of God came to earth and said to all people, come and follow me. I offer you something different to the rest of the world, a way of life that is unique and worth following. For those of us who are Christians, we've accepted that invitation and we've chosen to actually walk through that door. He says, not till we've done that, that we can actually see what's written on the other side. And it's something that actually puts all of that and what we're reading here into perspective. It says this. I chose you from before creation. But God in His grace, so we can understand it, sent His Son to invite us into His family. And once we actually walk through that door, we see that God has orchestrated the events of our life and the history of the world before it ever began. To send His Son to die for us so we would be his son or his daughter. So I just imagine God saying, as we make as we make that invitation something that we accept, I am so glad to welcome you into my home at last. My son, my daughter, I chose to save you before I even made the world. I sent my son to die for you on the cross. I've arranged history to make sure that you were actually born and to steer your life in a certain direction. Uh, I brought someone into your life to actually share the gospel with you as well so that you would recognize that Jesus is actually your Savior and your Lord. I carried you when you were weak and when things were hard. I held on to you when you tried to run away from me and do what you wanted to do. And now finally I can welcome you into my home. It's so good to see you. So I've loved you from before I created the world. See, the history of this world is not random. It's not governed by our choices. We, we aren't just kind of like the sum of all the decisions that we make in life. We're not accidents. Our lives aren't pointless. We're actually God's creation. And your life, whether you realize it and recognize it or not, is directed by the ruler of the universe. And he is extending that invitation to you to actually find your identity in him. Someone who's bigger than time. It's only found in Jesus. It's only found in Jesus. And this week we're going to see a bunch of things that are actually only found in Jesus. And the first one is that we're chosen in Him. That we're chosen in Jesus. Paul doesn't stop there though. Paul doesn't stop there in this passage. He goes on and he says that there's actually something else that we are blessed with when we're found in Him. When our identity 
is in Jesus. Have a look at me at verse 7. Because this second thing, it actually shows how God has chosen us. How this is possible. Have a look, verse 7 of chapter 1. It says, In Him we have redemption through His blood. That's Jesus' blood. The forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, He made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Christ. You see, there's a bunch of big words in there, but they actually have heaps of meaning. They have heaps of meaning that traces all the way back to the second book of the Bible. It's a book called Exodus. And in Exodus, there's the Israelites. The Israelites, right, they're God's people. And at this particular time, they're actually all slaves. Imagine a whole country being in slavery to another country. Does anyone know who the Israelites were slaves to? Anyone, pull it out. Egypt, good stuff. Still wait, what up? Okay, so the Israelites are in slavery to the Egyptians. And in Exodus, God was sending his judgment upon their sin by saying that he's actually going to strike down and kill the firstborn son in every family. As a punishment for their sin, he's like, someone has to pay, and I'm going to strike down the firstborn son. He said, but if you believe in me, and you trust in me, put a, grab a lamb, a Passover lamb, and sacrifice it by putting its blood on the doorway of your house. And when God saw that, and he saw that that penalty had been paid by putting this blood on their doorposts, his judgment passed over them. You see, with the precious blood of Jesus, our Passover lamb, who's been sacrificed in our place, we have that same redemption. We're also brought out of slavery to sin and given a new identity in Christ. We have freedom from the punishment that we deserve. And Paul's saying that forgiveness is found only in Him. And it's only because Jesus has done that that we're actually able to also be chosen in Him as well. That's the way that God brought this about and had planned it from before He even made the world. There's a, there's a story that I've heard that actually really helps me to understand what this means. And how this played out is actually personal for each of us in this room as well. It's a story about the American Civil War. And um, in the Civil War, it's where two sides from within one country are actually fighting against each other. And in America, this was the North versus the South. And the Northern Army and the Southern Army are fighting against each other. And one day, someone from the Southern Army captures a soldier from the Northern Army. And the policy was that if they captured an enemy troop, they had to kill them. And so they brought this soldier out and they stood him in a field and he had a blindfold on. There was someone who had their rifle lined up and they were going to shoot him. And just before they did, they took the blindfold off his face. And the man with the gun, he lowered it. And he walked over to his commanding officer and he said, I know this man. And, and I know his family. I, I, I'm killing him. And his commanding officer said, you know how we punish the enemy. And he said, I want to go and stand where he's standing. And so he walked out into the middle of the field and up to this soldier that was meant to be his enemy. And he said, I want to stand where you stand. And he took his place and was killed for him. I should have stood. And it's only through Jesus that we can find the forgiveness of our sins. Everything that we have ever done wrong in our life is paid for. Jesus is like our Passover lamb 
whose blood was spilled on our behalf so that we could actually be right with God. So that we could have a new identity in Him. And I wonder for you, are you actually forgiven by Jesus? Have you turned to Him and asked for the forgiveness of your sins? Does that define who you are or not? Second thing, the forgiven in Him. We're chosen in Jesus, but only because He's forgiven us of our sins. How do we know this is true, though? Some of you might be sitting there thinking, Mitch, I know that you said at the start there's something sure, firm, secure, that we can find our identity in, but how do I actually know that any of these things are real? How do I know that this exists? I'm glad you asked, because Paul actually um, tries to answer that for us. So we're going to look at verses 11 and 12 and see what Paul has to say. Have a look with me down there. It says, In him we were also chosen, so he's repeating what he said before, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And then verse 13 and 14, this is where he drives it home. He says, And you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth the gospel of your salvation. For when you believed, you were marked in Him with a seal. There's something evident that is given, a seal. The promised Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit? Well, verse 14 says, Who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. To the praise of His glory saying you were included in Christ when you heard and when you responded by believing, and now you've been given the Holy Spirit, He's only a deposit guaranteeing everything that is to come. Your place forever with me in heaven. And I'm going to show you that by actually giving you my spirit to live in you and to teach you to live like me. You see, we're sealed in Him. We're marked with a seal. Imagine like a brand on a cow. That's kind of the idea behind this. There's something permanent and visible and obvious. It's a guarantee. It's kind of like a, a tattoo. I know for me, when I, um, when I got my first tattoo, my, my mum was absolutely horrified. She's like, you know that that thing's permanent, right? Sorry. Yeah, that kind of the point. So, and you know that other people can see that. I was like, I also realised that other people can see that. Yes. Good one. She's like, and you know that you can't ever get rid of it. I was like, yes. Thank you for explaining all of the really obvious things about my tattoo for me. I really, really appreciate that. And you see, with a tattoo, all those things are true. Permanent, visible, it's obvious to others. It's a mark on you that is there forever. You can't hide it. You can't get rid of it. You see, you don't actually have to get a tattoo to show that you are actually in Christ. Don't go home and say, Mum, Mitch said for me to go home and get a tattoo to kind of affirm that I'm in Jesus. Didn't say that. Um, but God actually says that I've already sealed you. I've marked you in Jesus with my spirit. And it makes a permanent and a visible change to you. And it's actually there to remind you of who you've become through Jesus. You see, the marks that I've put on my body are things that I want to be reminded of. Things that are important to me. And it's the same with the Spirit. We know that He's a deposit because He reminds us about Jesus and our identity in Him. It's a lasting mark on your identity. And so the third and final thing that Paul tells us in this passage that is found only in Jesus is that we're actually sealed. We have a mark that is obvious. 
seal with the Spirit. As we close tonight, the question that I have for you is this. Now that we've actually heard about the identity that God offers us in Jesus, where are you going to find your identity? Where are you going to find your identity? Are you going to find it where it's always been? Or are you going to find it as someone chosen, forgiven, and sealed by God? You see, if you're here this week and you're a Christian, this is the point of this week. In Jesus, you actually have a purpose that directs your life far more than you've ever realized. You have a true and a God-given identity, and it is found only in Jesus and nowhere else. And I want to actually encourage and challenge you to think really, really hard about that this week. There are so many things in this world that want to distract you and tear you away from that, but I want you to think with everything you have about what you're hearing this week. Because if it's true, it will change your life forever. And if you're here and you're not a Christian, here's the point of this week. I want you to consider that if the claims that are made about Jesus are actually true, what would that mean for your life? What would it mean for your life if these claims are actually true? I don't have the answer to every single one of your questions, but I know this. I've tried to convince myself before that Christianity isn't true. But the news that you've heard tonight and you're going to keep hearing this week, it is the best news that you will ever hear. It is so much better than wherever you're putting your identity right now. What would it mean for you if you're not a Christian? If this was true? The reality is this. But we're actually not who other people say we are. You might have people trying to speak into your life and tell you heaps of different things. You are not who other people say you are. And you're not who your sins say you are. And you're not who the devil might try and tell you you are. You're not even who you say you are. We are who God says we are. And in Jesus, He says you're chosen. He says you're forgiven. And He says you are sealed. And He says you're only going to find that in Him. I'm going to pray. And I'm going to sing together in response to this. Father, I thank you so much that in Jesus we actually have an identity that is worth thinking about. And I just pray uh, and plead with you that this week you would help us to think uh, harder than ever about this. To be stirred more than ever by the truths that we find in your word. And Lord, I just pray that for those of us who do know Jesus, this week would cause us to love him more and want to live for him even more. And I pray that for those of us here who don't already know Jesus, that this would be a week where we actually ask all of our questions and ultimately put our trust in him because we realize that his way is far better than our way and the identity that he offers is far better than the one that we can find anywhere else. I just pray and ask for this in Christ's name.